Hi, my name is Phil. I like talking about politics, and in this video, I'd like to discuss one specific lesson from the US presidential election as it pertains to Labour's plans to win the next election and continue those plans, uh, to which they called a decade of renewal. Because in amongst the Trump heavy questions at PMQs today, Keir Starmer gave a very interesting answer to Lib Dem Labour uh, uh, leader Ed Davey. And although some would say he was skirting around the main points of the question, he nonetheless showed with his answer that he understands the principal reason why the Democrats lost and that he will not be making the same mistake next election. Not that learning lessons guarantees success, but it does help. But first, for daily political commentary, please click the subscribe button so you don't miss out. So, I'm going to start off with Professor Rob Ford of the University of Manchester, politics professor, he made a very interesting point, as he often does, in the wake of Trump's not even remotely close victory in the end. He asked if there was any incumbent anywhere in the world who hasn't suffered major voter repudiation for election since the post-COVID inflation surge. Someone did suggest that with the, the elections coming up in Ireland, maybe that will book the trend. And he did sort of say, well, maybe, yes, if there's going to be a case of a government that gets away with it, maybe it's one that's got more money than it knows what to do with. However, in general, it is a really interesting point. It ties in with one of the most interesting comments I have received on the channel talking about the election from our American friends. They told me that their experience in America was that people thought life was better under Trump than Biden. And this is because what they were really remembering was life before COVID and then comparing it to life since COVID. And there's a fundamental point here about elections. There's one reason why Trump won and Harris lost. Um, actually, there's lots of reasons, but there's one that's really relevant here. Because let's be honest, Trump did not run a good campaign. Trump was not a good candidate. But when it comes to elections, time and again, we keep seeing that the economy is the most important factor. But what is the economy? Now, to those who look at politics and economics quite deeply, we essentially are saying, well, it's GDP. So, for example, when Liz Truss complain, when Labour say, oh, Liz Truss crashed the economy and the public sort of believe it. And it's no, oh, I didn't, I didn't. It's sort of true, she didn't. Because crashing the economy literally means... GDP goes down significantly um, and that didn't happen then. So that's what we mean. We mean GDP. And you can look at what Biden has done. You can look at it on graphs and charts and you can point out to people how Biden actually managed the economy really well. But when election analysts say that the economy is the most important factor and certainly when voters themselves say this in polls, they don't mean GDP. Most people don't even know what GDP stands for, much less what it is. Now, what they mean is their standard of living. It's based on this assumption that if the country is doing well, they'll be doing well, right? Um, but what they actually mean is, can they afford to do more than they used to be able to do or less? Are they having to cut back or are they actually finding that they can afford more things or nicer things? What is their standard of living compared with what they think their standard of living should be. Now, in the wake of COVID, inflation went well above target in a lot of countries around the world, including America. People noticed that things became more expensive because it happened quite quickly. If their pay wasn't boosted enough to compensate in the minds of voters, then that perception of a standard of living doesn't matter whether it's accurate or not. For some people, it will be, maybe not for others. But that perception tells them that the government's clearly not doing right by them. So reiterating that the, you know, there are potentially lots of factors at play in this election results, one of them is going to be absolutely the fact that what people prioritise when voting for government is that perception of the standard of living. And so I turn to PMQs today, where there was a, a little ray of sunshine in one of Starmer's answers. He'd first of all dealt with Kemi Badenoch as the new leader of the opposition. As expected, she leant heavily into try and drive a wedge between the US and UK governments by poking at what David Lammy in particular had said about Trump in the past and trying to goad Keir Starmer into inviting Trump to speak to the House of Commons. Didn't work. But it shows she's, she's prepared to try and goad Trump into punishing the UK. In other words, she will act against the UK's interests just for her own private ambitions. 
But in one particularly good comeback, Badenoch was accusing Starmer on a couple of occasions of using pre-scripted lines, to which he replied, if she's going to complain about scripted answers, it's probably best not to read that out. And while we're on good comebacks, because I, I must give Starmer a shout out to another one. I actually, I actually thought he was on pretty good form against the Tories today. So James cleverly piped up as a backbencher, of course. And Starmer sat him down with a superb line. He said that his problem is he can't add up. If he could add up, he might be down here instead of up there. But Ed Davies' questions, much more interesting and way more relevant. I actually very much liked his questions. He used them to express concern for Ukraine and the prospect of trade wars. Now, although Starmer gave certain assurances in his answers in terms of our government's position, um, again, he didn't take the questions head on. But in his response to Davies' second question about the prospect of a trade war, he said something that gives me a little bit of hope. He talked about how his government was putting the economy at the centre of everything. Yeah, yeah, we've heard that before. And then he said, this will be measured in how people feel the benefits in their pockets, which was the best news I'd heard all day. Like Seriously, this day has been a stinker. Even the builders outside are having a very loud argument, which I'm not sure is a sign that all is going well. <laughs> so what this response from Starmer means is that he does not expect to go into the next election waving around a graph that says, look, we did good things with the economy, but you, know, you might need a magnifying glass and a master's degree in maths to, to appreciate it. No, he's going to measure the success of his government in how people feel. That's what that answer says. It's not a government who's going to tell people that they've done a great job and they should be happy. No, it's going to ask them if they're happy. And this should be obvious, shouldn't it? It should be basic that any government measures its success according to how people feel they are doing. But not that many governments do that. It's why populists do so well. They're very in tune with that emotional side of politics. Trump tapped into it in 2016. Again, this year, I suppose. Although there's a hell of a lot of rambling in between this year. A big story of this election may just be that the Democrats were the latest victims of the post-COVID inflation surge. Some governments deserved to be victims because they didn't manage it well. They didn't consider the impacts on people's standard of living. Some tried to manage it well, but even managing it well, arguably, is still net worse than life before COVID. It's not a story that will be told much in the media because people like to talk about the deeper philosophies. I noticed a comment from Owen Jones. He was in New York. He was tweeting that his Pakistani American cab driver said that they voted for Trump because the prices were too high under Biden. This is how it works. Those of us who are into our politics, we will talk endlessly about whether we should have more regulation or less regulation or more privatisation or more state production, higher taxes and spending or lower taxes and spending and so on. But most people don't care about that. Hold up polls that show people like one policy over another as much as you like. Polls are by definition filled in by people who are prepared to talk about politics. Most people just want things to work. They just want the government to fix what's broken or what they perceive as is being broken and maintain what isn't. They don't care how you do it. They just want it done. And they will use their next vote as a judgment on how well you, you met their standards. And sure, that's not every vote. I'm not saying every voter in the country does that. It doesn't necessarily even have to be the vast majority of voters. But it is the vast majority of voters who will switch from one party or candidate in one election to another in the next election. It is, after all, swing voters who are key in elections because those who think more deeply about politics tend to be more fixed in who they all vote for. And the reason these people are swing voters is because they don't care about political arguments. They just care about whether or not the government are seen to be helping or hindering their standard of living. So people like me sit back and go, how could Americans vote for Trump? He is a clear threat to US security. But the reality is that those swing voters don't think about that. They just think to themselves, price of bread's gone up a bit. Mm, it's cost me more to put petrol in my car or gas, as they would call it. And it is perception. Sometimes that perception is absolutely correct. Sometimes that perception is dead wrong. 
Another commentator was talking about how Americans are lied to about their fuel prices, that they're told by their own media that they're the most expensive in the world. It's not at all. I will just point out to our American friends, your fuel prices are dirt cheap compared to Europe. You are a producer, but perception matters. So it's vital that Labour do measure their success based on how people feel. You can't tell people how to feel. Good con artists can sort of shift how, the, how people perceive those feelings, but you can't tell them. You have to just react to it. You know, it's how people feel about how heavy or light their pockets are, about how well public services are serving them, about whether immigration is working in their favour or not. And Starmer's response to David did give me hope there. It shows he understands. Doesn't guarantee future success, but it means he's at least prioritising what matters to swing voters, as much as it might run counter to what politically engaged people think matters the most. Because to those of us interested in politics, what matters the most about the US election is it's a blow against democracy, it's a blow against decency. But what mattered to the people who swung that election was my grocery bills have gone up. But there we are. Those are my thoughts. Let me know yours in the comments below. If you enjoyed the video, please click the like button. If you'd like to support the channel further, you can join for memberships. Thanks for watching. Until next time, I'll see you later.